So hello grade tens, it's time for some geometric optics. Let's have a look and see first what we mean by this. <clears throat> now we spent the first unit dealing with the microscopic world. <clears throat> this is the macroscopic, okay? Mostly. So we see this is the <clears throat> physics of mirrors, lenses, and such like. Okay? So that's what we're going to be looking at over the next little while. A little bit of history, not too much. We'll just talk a little bit about it just to give you a perspective on it. <clears throat> and of course, when we go back too far, the written record disappears. And so who knows what happened way back. But what we do know, at least there's records of, is that the Romans had found, probably by accident, that if you looked through certain gemstones and so forth, you could improve your vision. <clears throat> About 50% of the world's population are myopes in the sense that we are nearsighted. Uh, this is also a function of your race. Um, Asian people tend to have a much higher incidence of myopia compared to, let's say, uh, North American Aboriginals, <clears throat> which have hardly any, uh, and I'm not going to, to suppose why this is the case, it just turns out that way. And so, as a consequence, and um, sometimes uh, some of the myops are quite significantly so, so the glasses they, they use are very thick. And, of course, this all gets drawn into the nonsense of, a, uh, of, of the stereotypes of academically inclined people, <clears throat> which, of course, are complete nonsense. Now, so Caligula apparently was very nearsighted, uh, arguably for not just optically, but as a, as a Roman emperor as well, but I digress. Uh, but nevertheless, he uh, used to look through some kind of a ruby so he could actually see what was going on in the Colosseum. Um, if we move ahead a thousand years, <clears throat> we have uh, an Assyrian. So this is a, a person of uh, Arabic ancestry named Ibn Saul around 960 uh, CE. <clears throat> who um, produced some optics and perhaps might would have been a spotting scope of some kind. Uh, again, the records are kind of fuzzy. <clears throat> this was dramatized in the Kevin Costner version of Robin Hood where the uh, Morgan Freeman character actually had a telescope of like a, 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 a single monocular that would show things closer than they were. And of course, if you read history, you'll know that uh, most of the time people say that this didn't exist until the 1600s, uh, perhaps in southern Holland or northern Belgium and so forth. Well, I think probably we can say a few things about this with, without getting into too much, but it's pretty clear that, so let me, I should write a few words down here. So we have, of course, the Romans and their crystals. Now, who knows? The Egyptians were pretty smart too. Who knows who else got into things? I guess it depends on how many crystals and gemstones you found, whether you found by accident uh, doing things. And then we have Ibn Saul, 960 CE. <clears throat> and then there's discussion perhaps of a spotting scope of some type of device. We also know <clears throat> that trade uh, between <clears throat> the Christians uh, and <clears throat> uh, uh, Islam was, uh, <clears throat> we won't say it didn't exist, but it was reduced, let's say. So technical innovation <clears throat> such as this did not get passed around the way it might have been passed around had it been discovered in Germany or something like that. And so this is a natural political tendency. However, it must have worked to some extent because we've got paintings in the 13, 1400s uh, in, say, Italy, etc., especially in the South, <clears throat> wearing spectacles. 
So by then, <clears throat> this must have been something that came along. <clears throat> and was this left over from here? Where did it come from somewhere else? Who knows? The big jump, if you want to call it that, was in the <clears throat> late 1500s. You had a large uh, cut glass uh, industry. <clears throat> and this was in a lot of places. <clears throat> uh, but the one that made this happen was in either northern Belgium, southern Holland, <clears throat> And this was, of course, prosperous times for this region. The Dutch were trading with the uh, the Indies out in the east for the spice trade and so on, and they were making, uh, uh, you know, uh, as non not a small fortune doing so. There was also, of course, cut glass industries in England and other places. However, it seems <clears throat> that the physics aspect of this uh, came that, that we use today comes out of this realm here, and maybe was also something used to explain what we saw before. It's hard to say. Um, and um, so that's sort of the background and of course the first innovations that really show up are the ones that help people and uh, this of course comes with the issue of spectacles giving how many people had either one of two issues myopia or as they age on set um, hyperopia where you have the issue of reading now of course a lot of people in those years were illiterate but they did different types of trades they might have done uh, like sewing, for example, and if you uh, no longer can see fairly close or in detail, then it's very much more difficult to do that type of work. So either way, there was a pretty significant impetus, and the eyeglass was one of the most, one of the first prosthetic technologies that have profoundly changed how it is for us. If you're a myop, think about your life if you could not see beyond. In my personal example, I'm in focus to about 20 centimeters or so, and after that. Who knows? And <clears throat> imagine, you know, not being able to see the distance views, the birds, the mountains, and the what have you. Your life would be pretty, pretty local. And uh, so this this effect that that's, um, optical spectacles gave everyone is a pretty, pretty profound one. Um, <clears throat> and mathematically, in Holland, uh, there was a fellow named Willebrod. Snell, and he actually worked out the laws of how light uh, bends its path as it goes through substances, primarily glass, uh, and aptly named the Dutch word for fast is Snell, so there you go. So let's, um, there's a little bit of a history lesson, let's not uh, belabor it, but it does give you a bit of context about these things. Now let's uh, for this first lesson, I want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about images. So let us start again here. Let's, uh, let's write this a different way. Instead of saying what is an image, let's say what is required. Uh, for an image. To form. Let's, let's look at that. That's really the question. Now it's easy, of course, we got lenses and this and that and the other thing and we can say, but let, let's Let's look at, okay, so here we are, we're in Canada. I know you didn't get to go to Algonquin Park, but we have a white spruce tree here. <clears throat> and over here, this is the uh, object. And over here, we have an image. And let's just draw the image in a different color, so it's clear that's an image. And we're not going to worry about orientation differences for now. That all comes with the details. So here's the image of our white pine tree. And in between here we have a really cool uh, 
optic that makes the image. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> now I'm not trying to be completely silly here. What I'm trying to do is make a point. But whether we're using um, a child's magnifying glass or we're using the Hubble Space Telescope it makes no difference. What is required to form an image from the light that's reflecting off an object or emitted by the object, either way, is always the same. There is a fundamental constraint that is necessary. Now, if you look at in a mirror, you see a reflection of yourself or an object. And if you look at the wall beside it, you don't see that reflection. You see nothing. And yet the rays are there. We know they're there. Okay. So let's just start looking at it that way first and try to divine. I'm going to hold you away for a minute here. Just let you think about this a little bit. So here we have this example I just gave. We have a mirror. And here we have a wall. And here we have the object. And here we get an image. <clears throat> There's an image in the mirror. And here we have no image. <clears throat> now, sometimes Students are going to skim. Oh, but in this case, it's, and these are all specifics. And maybe you know a little bit about it and you can give me some specifics, but that's not important. Because the thing I'm looking at, the principle I'm trying to explain to you, is that it's the same for everything. It's not specific to a mirror on a wall or what have you. <clears throat> let's, let's take the classic device that is used to show images to children. Take a box <clears throat> and we'll put a hole in it like this big. It's called a pinhole camera but it isn't really a pinhole. It's usually um, maybe five, seven or eight centi millimeters across. And we'll use the word camera in quotations. So here's our <clears throat> tree again. Now let's see what happens with this. <clears throat> from the top of the tree, from the crown, we have rays going in every direction that they can. Right. But we have a special ray, which I'll do in different color. <clears throat> And this ray comes, <clears throat> I'm better drawing it backwards, it comes in the crown and happens to go through the hole, just by luck. Okay. All the other rays, <clears throat> I'm going to make my hole just a little smaller here, just so that it, uh, there we go. <clears throat> All the other rays, most of them, from the top of the tree, go off, either hit the wall of the, of the camera or just go off into space somewhere. We can say the same thing about the bottom of the tree to take two ends. We'd have rays going every way we want, but if we're careful here, we'll have a ray that goes all the way in. I'll, uh, without making this too messy, clearly any point along this tree, you would have a point in here. That would seem quite reasonable. Now, we do get an image in here. It's fairly dim, but you will get an image. It will be upside down, but we get an image. <clears throat> now, we need to think about this. There's no lens here. Okay? There's no lens in the pinhole camera. So why are we getting an image? Most of us, or we have to have a lens or a mirror or more than one lens or something or other, yet we get an image. 
And I think this device is going to show us what happens, and that is this. <clears throat> if we take the light <clears throat> from the tip of this tree, and it goes in all conceivable directions, and the ray that comes through here that has information about the top of the tree is the only ray that hits here. The, other, the rays from the middle of the tree and the bottom of the tree are not allowed to hit here. They can't. They're, they're physically prevented from doing so by the front of the camera. Exactly the same thing is done for the bottom of the tree. The ray that comes through strikes here. The rays from the other parts of the tree cannot strike here. So the information that we get here The info is unique to a specific part of the object. And so it is not smeared. It is not contaminated by other parts. And thus an image is formed. So whether you're using the Hubble Space Telescope or um, I mean, and it, there's a billion dollar optical system, you still have this end of the galaxy, whatever you're taking a picture of, uh, and when it gets into the expensive fancy detectors, in the end, there must be this coherence of information. And if we scramble it, it'll be out, we would call it out of focus or blurred or something like that. Because at the same point, we're getting information from more than one part of the image in the same point. Now, whatever you do going forward in optics, you have to always remember that this is what we're trying to do. And it doesn't matter whether it's a pinhole camera that's a few dollars uh, or a hole in a piece of paper that you're projecting the sun onto the ground or uh, a multi-million dollar device. We're all doing the same thing. We may do it in a much more complex, expensive way. I will accept that we'll get a much sharper image. We will get an image that is much brighter with far less light here, absolutely. But the logic is exactly the same. Okay, so I know it's not too big a start, but I wanted to start with this and let you think about it a little bit. Uh, and then we will start getting into the uh, theoretical aspects of how we can actually use <clears throat> lenses as first to produce better and brighter images than we get with the pinhole camera. The pinhole camera, and just to talk just briefly about its limitations, of course, is the image is very dim. And you can't access it very easily. Uh, you cannot uh, take this image, for the most part, and shine it on something. Um, we can do that only if we have an incredibly bright object, because so much of the light that comes from the tree it is not permitted in the camera. So we're getting an incredibly small percentage of the light here. So this is a more of a demonstration device. And this is why, if you think about it as a camera, when we have, in the old days, we had chemical film here, okay, it had to be very, very light sensitive because the image inside coming through was fairly dim. Now, when we got some decent lenses, but if you look at old cameras way, way back, those cameras were not, uh, the lenses they had weren't any fun. They were not very special. Sometimes they were very small. And so the amount of light that they were bringing in <clears throat> was more than this would bring in. It wasn't that much. And so you had to have a, a photosensitive plate that was actually quite sensitive. Otherwise, uh, you would have to wait uh, seconds or more for the image to form. Thanks for watching. So if we reconstruct the pinhole camera, it does give us some interesting results. So here's the, the pinhole where the rays converge, sort of. Notice how they cross through each other and do not interfere with each other. So when this ray passes through this ray, they don't mess each other up, like, say, tennis balls would, for example. Uh, so it's just a property that's interesting. Now, we can do a bit of geometry here. Um, we can make certain assumptions that uh, first, well, let's just label our little triangle system here. And we will say, assume 
which is reasonable, at least for the first approximation, that AB is parallel to DE. And thus, you've got angle BAC uh, equals angle uh, DEC. And this is transversal parallel lines theorem. And we also have angle ACB equals angle DCE. And this is the opposite angle theorem. And as such then, therefore, triangles ABC is similar to triangle, uh, let's see, uh, DEC. Uh, angle angle similarity theorem. Now when that happens of course we pick up we can do some constructions here. Let's use black. So we will just uh, imagine a line here like so and as we already drove over here now we'll draw the bisectors in like this uh, and like this and we'll add a couple of letters so we're going to call this one F and we'll call this one uh, G and uh, because these triangles are isosceles uh, then everything will be similar so uh, triangle the triangles are isosceles and there's no reason for them not to be Uh, so, the respective half triangles uh, are congruent. Now they're reflections, but they have the same dimension, so put here reflection. So, we can extend our similarity argument and say that, uh, so, due to the similar triangles, then the ratio of AB over DE is equal to the ratio of CF over uh, CG, say. Okay? Now, now we want to extend this uh, into the uh, the physical situation. So A B is the height of the image we'll call that high h sub i uh, de is the height of the object i'm going to call that ho um, fc is the distance of the image uh, and we're going to call it di now notice this is measured from the point where the pinhole was okay and then cg is the distance of the object from the pinhole we'll call that do we'll also notice that the image here is inverted. And we want to be able to show that in our way of describing mathematically what's happening. So let's clear the board and we'll have a little more a look more at the practical realities of the naming aspects and the types of images.
types of images. First one is a real image. And to be a real image, the image must be projectable. onto a screen. So you can start thinking about images that you see. For example, the image of the bathroom mirror is not projectable. You can see yourself, but it doesn't project the image of you onto the wall somewhere else. And so naturally, the second type is what we call a virtual image. and this is not projectable. So this would be such as the bathroom mirror as I just mentioned. So, uh, now, we want to look at the consequences of all of this and pick up some relationships if we can here. So, the algebraic signs So, a negative sign is implying inverted if we're dealing with a height or a virtual image. So this is for height and this is for distance. Okay. Now the positive image would you as a positive number pardon me, positive sign, which we won't bother with, we'll just put with there not negative, that implies that the image is erect. and that it is real. Okay, so once again this is the distance and this is the height. In our pinhole camera we have by similar triangles Pi over ho equals di over do. But hi is, oops, we have to remember that our image is inverted. Okay? So, high is less than zero. And so, thus, our equation must be modified and we end up with high over ho equals negative Di over do. And we have a negative sign. Okay? And uh, this is one of our first equations we'll use in optics. It's pretty straightforward, but you can see the situation. And um, there's not a great deal. Uh, you, you have to kind of accept some of these new things. If I say to a real image is projectable, you know what I mean by a projection of a project, like a projector, that's what we call them that back, actually. And clearly a bathroom mirror cannot generate such an image. Now we'll get back to these things, but this is just to show you um, how this can work. Okay, let's move on then.
Now, our pinhole camera has some problems. So first we'll put here in parenthesis, it's just not practical. So we have a very dim images. If we're not in brilliant sunlight or something like that, you're not going to see much of anything. Um, the image is not accessible. So we know it's there, but it's hard to see it, which doesn't help. Uh, the image is inverted. Now this may be okay, or we might have to fix it, but at least it's there and it's not the standard way we would like things to go. And can't adjust the image size. And so we seek to improve uh, the, our lot, um, increasing the brightness of images, allowing them to be perhaps projectable or something where we can actually see them and use them, make them accessible. Uh, perhaps we can fix the inversion problem, but that's probably the least of our concerns. And adjusting the image size, so you want to look at something that's farther away you want to bring it closer and magnified and so on so we also found in the previous equation which I neglected to mention so we'll do it now we have high over ho equals negative di over do this is also equal to the magnification which we'll call M Now this will surprise you, but M is usually uh, much less than 1. The image of a tree, for example, in our example before, is usually, almost always, uh, far smaller than the tree. Star, note, M for inverted images of either type uh, is less than zero. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of new terms and rules here and you have to summarize them and remind you uh, of these and perhaps uh, what I will do in this section because we have the ability to calculate a little bit is we'll, I'll uh, generate somehow a worksheet and let you uh, play with that. Uh, I'll post on my web page and you can work away at some of those. None of this is that difficult yet, I'm not too worried just yet, but just to give you an idea. All right. <clears throat> so we want to move ahead on this. So let's let's see now. We go back 400-ish years or even way far back. And what we know, <clears throat> so the first clues, if you will, was that <clears throat> crystals, glass, such, uh, transparent media, um, distort, 
the light path. Uh, this can improve vision in a way we didn't understand. And it seems, just by basic looking at it, bends the light path. And so it was that wealthy nations uh, generally have the resources so that the living of their citizens is easier. And therefore, some of the citizens can do other tasks other than spending their whole day trying to find enough to eat. And such was it was in Europe in the around 1600s, is certainly in Holland, uh, among other places. And so the Amsterdam and Holland of the postcards that you see today was largely built at that time due to the spice trade. And prosperity came not only to the Netherlands, but to other parts of Europe as well because of the trade, because of the ability to the better boats and the astronomical navigational tools such as sextants and so on allowed for more, more dependable circumstances. And so um, an analysis was made. of how light behaves as it passes through transparent media. Now, before we go too far, we're going to assume in air, and I'll put in parentheses mostly, you have to try pretty hard, uh, and in a vacuum, light travels in straight lines. And we call these rays. Now remember, we're not dealing uh, with the microscopic quite the same as we were before. Uh, we're dealing with a macroscopic world here. So we recognize there's photons and all the rest. We still recognize that light has wave properties that can be observed. Uh, but that's already the big issue here. So let's uh, go another step here. If we have a light ray like so, and we take a glass block that is square, rectangular like so, the light will pass through and be very slightly dimmer. Depending on the glass, uh, you might lose somewhere around 4%. You see this in the school lab rooms when you look at the uh, lab uh, cabinets and there's glass doors on them and you can see a reflection in them but you can also see the stuff inside uh, and that reflection is in the neighborhood about four percent and we can all come back to these when we talk about and this is reflected pretty much off the top and a bit absorbed inside but okay whatever however if we can't the block like so The light ray will come in like so and exit here and there is horizontal shift. You can do this with any piece of glass. The thicker it is, the more effective. It's the thickness that will demonstrate it. Now from this basic effect, if you use a very thin pencil of light, you can reveal this, that the light bends, path bends, uh, 
at the boundary between air and glass, in this case, and glass and air. So, to be very clear, we have a bend here, and we have yet another one here. And somehow the light does this Z pattern. And so this is an effect that was noticed, and they didn't have the, the analysis capabilities, of course, that we have today. But what they did notice was the following. Let me redraw this a little bit um, so that we have a, a bit bigger view here. So here's your glass block just as I drew a few minutes ago, like so. And here's the light ray and coming in like so and leaving here. And the discrepancy here, this, this shift, if you will, this H. And we have this pathway here. Now, what um, we could use as an analogy would be the following. So let's take a separate example here. First off, we have uh, a roadway. So this is, uh, this is uh, asphalt, say. And this is, um, we'll say, mud. Now, if for one reason or another you're driving along <clears throat> and the car happens to get the front wheel into the mud, the other three wheels are free on the pavement, but the right front wheel in this case is in the mud. So the car has been traveling, let's say, in this direction. This uh, is going to create a lot more force here than here, more friction, and this is going to cause a rotational effect. And what we're going to notice is that the vehicle will pull and try to travel like so. Now we also can recognize that here the car can travel fast, and here it travels slow. Er. Okay. Now let's uh, retrace this and we'll draw it again. <clears throat> now we have a car that is coming out of a maybe a dirt road, doesn't have to be uh, stuck in the mud necessarily. And uh, here we have the case where we got one wheel left still and we have this so. And so, let's uh, let's redraw that. I'm sorry, I've got the angle a little too aggressive. So let's uh, let's redraw it. <clears throat> now, so my car is coming out more like this. And this back corner here is going to be more friction based. This is all free to move, and it's going to pull us. So we were traveling this way, and as we come out, we, we get pulled towards this way. Now, one minor point of, of description is the angles. You are used to measuring angles from the X. These angles are not measured from the X, they are measured from the vertical. So let's construct a line here. And... Um, we can put a line here if we want to, makes no difference. Another line here, and say one here. Okay, and so we're measuring the angle. This is called a normal because it is perpendicular to the surface of the, of the interface here. Okay, and here we have an angle. Okay, and so these, it's critically important so that these angles 
are measured from the normal. So if we forget that, when we try to do these questions, we're going to get ourselves in trouble. If we look now back uh, to the 1600s, what they could say then, using this practical analogy, uh, and of course they didn't have cars then, it was military troops they used, but the example is the same. The situation, the suggestion then is, here it's betting away from the normal. Our normal here is right there. The normal here is right here. So in this case, the <clears throat> light comes in and the normal can travel right through here. It's no problem. So, and <clears throat> And this is, of course, an absolute nonsense. Sorry, folks, I have to redo the diagram. It'll only take a second. I don't know what I was thinking. My goodness, I should know better than that. So hopefully whoever is going to write a, a nasty comment to me will do so after they've watched the entire video. Once again, let's draw our, our block here. And we have the incident ray coming in like this. That's perfectly okay. And we have the normal poking up like this. And we'll have it go through. And <clears throat> the ray would bend like so. And then would bend back. So this ray is parallel to this one. And we can still construct this delta H here, this is all still the same. The only thing I did wrong was have the refracting thing on the wrong side, which is not good enough, of course, but it isn't too terrible. So here we go. And so the suggestion then <clears throat> was because as you come in to this membrane, the ray bends towards the normal, <clears throat> you have a situation where you're going faster and now you bend towards the normal, you're now going slower. <clears throat> When we come out of the mud onto the asphalt road, we bend away from the normal because we're moving from a slower to a faster medium. If we look here, we'll see <clears throat> that as we come out, we're going to be bending away from the normal. So it was easy then to suggest <clears throat> that this is a slow, the speed of light changes inside the medium. Now we spent time earlier in this course looking at the speed of light uh, and of course that's always done in a vacuum. <clears throat> we do it in the atmosphere which doesn't sh change it very much. Okay, so with this information let's take the next step now that we have this done correctly. So <clears throat> there's then a factor based on a material that indicates how much light appears to slow down. Now we have to be careful about what it really is doing. <clears throat> Remember that we don't really understand the true nature of light. And uh, it's not wrong to say that it appears to slow down. That's something we can't observe. But we 
can't say it is slowing down because we don't really know how the light radiation is propagating at that level. So we want to be careful of what we say. You know, it may walk like a duck and talk like a duck, but it could be a goose. So we have to be careful scientifically with these things. Anyhow, we introduced this concept. The letter N is equal to uh, the speed of light in the vacuum divided by the speed of light in the medium. So this is in the medium, and this is in a vacuum. So N is always greater than 1. It is known as the index of refraction. And we have some common values for this. <clears throat> so we have, of course, the vacuum and air, water, glass, and allow me to be sexist for a minute, for the girls, a diamond. So one point is exactly 1.0. <clears throat> Air is like 1.0003 or something. Water is around 1.33. There's no units here. We're dividing by two velocities. So this is what we call dimensionless. Glass is around 1.5. Different types of glass have different numbers, and that's for the smart people. But this gives us a rough idea. And diamond is around 2.2. <clears throat> now, what we're going to do... <clears throat> is recognize uh, the next step here is try to find a relationship so we can predict how much these angles actually what they really are <clears throat> based on the logic that I said in my last slide <clears throat> this is something called Snell's laws is named after as I said yesterday well not yesterday but earlier in this video <clears throat> that this was done by a Dutchman, Willebrod Snell, and the word Snell in Holland, Dutch means fast. So it's appropriate, of course. Now let's draw an interface here. Let's make this diagram fairly substantial so we can see what's going on. And we have light coming at an angle. And so uh, I think just for the clarity here, I'm going to remove every other one just to make the Ray a little bit more obvious. There we go. And so these are crests, okay, of uh, light, and I'll put a parenthesis or bracket or quotes here, waves. But we know light has wave character, so this is perfectly reasonable. Now, after the ray goes uh, through the membrane, we'll assume this is air and this is glass or something, we're going to have a bending. The ray will now behave more like this. <clears throat> so the question now is what is this, <clears throat> what is going on here that we can try to infer some things. So first we recognize if we draw a line from here to here that is perpendicular, that this will be the wavelength of light <clears throat> and we will have this is the first one and we'll draw another one here and this will be the wavelength of the light that is inside so just by this simple construction we can see immediately that the wavelength of the light changes <clears throat> now we'll get back to consequences in a minute let's just convince ourselves that we know what's going on here now we'll construct our normal. In this case, it goes right through here. And we're going to have our theta here, okay? And we'll construct yet another normal here. And uh, in there we're going to have theta two. <clears throat> uh, this one didn't show very well, so we'll just use an arrow and say theta one. <clears throat> now let's do a little bit of uh, elementary geometry here 
we know that this is a right angle therefore this angle plus this angle equals 90 degrees this is a right angle and therefore this angle plus this angle equals 90 degrees theta 2 is right in here so this angle plus the angle on the other side of the red line equals 90 degrees therefore this angle is this angle so we will remind ourselves of that theta 2 here and the exact same logic is used for uh, this line as well theta 1 now let's see what we can come up with here in the standpoint of a derivation we have uh, a common line which we'll just label as H and we can say okay sine theta 1 is equal to opposite over hypotenuse is equal to lambda 1 divided by H <clears throat> sine theta 2 also equal to opposite over hypotenuse is equal to lambda uh, 2 pardon me over H So, so far, not too bad. Okay. Now, let's look at a couple of other things that we have to remember here. We have that the speed of light is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. And since N is equal to C over V sub L, then if you exchange these two, we could have <clears throat> V sub L equals C over N. <clears throat> <clears throat> the frequency remains constant. And this is based on Planck's idea as the photonic energy is constant, more or less. So... <clears throat> If, v, if the speed goes down and the frequency is not changing, then the wavelength has to go down. So what we can see here <clears throat> is that we can make an argument now about these two different wavelengths. Okay, because this was effectively in a vacuum. <clears throat> So, but we can still construct it this way. We can say that uh, V sub L is equal to the frequency. Uh, let me rephrase this. <clears throat> uh, C over N1 equals the frequency times lambda one divided by n one and you'd also have c over n two equals the frequency times lambda two over n two <clears throat> now let's um see what we have here now and see how we can connect things <clears throat> okay so I've just made a bit of spot here. So let's re look at this here. So if we take C divided by N1, this is going to be equal to, the frequency doesn't change, so the wavelength has to be modified, so we don't have to put the N1 underneath it. That would be a vacuum wavelength. And then the same thing for here. We can take what I had here before and establish these two ratios by simply solving for H. This is common here. And so we can just rearrange them to solve for the hypotenuse and get this relationship. Now we have <clears throat> lambda 1 is going to be equal to C over N1F. Lambda 2 will equal C over N2F. So let's put that <clears throat> into this equation. So now we have 
C over N1F quantity divided by sine theta 1. Remember again, these angles are the taken from the normal, even though I rejigged it a bit. Here we have C over N2F quantity <clears throat> sine theta 2. Now, the C and the F are constants, <clears throat> and so they can go. <clears throat> and uh, so let's make a bit of space here. So now we're left with <clears throat> 1 over N1 divided by sine theta 1. But what's that really equal to? <clears throat> well, let's look at it and see. So if we take, um, we could argue that you're taking 1 over n and multiplying by 1 over sine theta. <clears throat> and so this is really equal to 1 over n1 sine theta 1. And so, we get n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. And that, folks, is Snell's Law. And we can predict, then, <clears throat> how much the light will bend. If this is 1, it becomes a bit easier. But whatever the ratio happens to be, whatever substances we're dealing with, we can now pay, depend, theoretically predict in advance, how much the bend will be. And then, depending on the bend we want, we can make the shape of the glass to suit us. And this is the big step that allows us to begin to make optics that will do what we want them to do, instead of just taking advantage of, of happenstance in nature. So let's have a look and see what we were able to do with this. Well, we took the horizontal block. We've looked at that. <clears throat> let's take a triangular prism. Now, of course, we could make them out of any shape we want to, but let's not be so difficult. <clears throat> and so we're going to try a standard prism, and I'll make it a little bigger, I guess. Show the effects here. <clears throat> and uh, so we'll have an incident ray. We'll use similar colors. <clears throat> have our ray come like so. And then we have our normal through here, like this. The ray will bend <clears throat> towards the normal, based on Snell's laws, to the other side of the prism. And then, <clears throat> once again, we have our normal. But now it is acting this way, based on the actual point. And it will now bend away from the normal, and the light will continue to travel something like this. Now, a discovery that was made by Newton, and maybe by others, who knows, uh, showed that here we got a spectrum that, <clears throat> in truth, the <clears throat> index of refraction is a function of the wavelength. Okay, and we would have <clears throat> red to blue. And many times this doesn't matter a lot depending on how precise you want things. But if we get into optical instruments and lenses and telescopes and so forth, where we're making quite precise measurements, uh, then 
this isn't good enough and we have to go from there. We'll come back to this. The same thing would be an issue if you have um, instruments that doctors are using to do surgeries. You don't want any ghosting and ghost reflections so that the surgeon makes a mistake. What we also found with experimentation is the following, and you can do this even, uh, and I'm sure we could come up with yet another relationship, but I don't want to clutter that. It's not important. So let's look at different sizes of triangles. <clears throat> we know that if we had a long thin triangle, like so, and then we had the one I just showed you. <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's make this a little less angled, like so perhaps, and then one that is more extreme. Now, I didn't mention in the previous diagram, but I'll do it here now. For the just for the sake of, of simplicity, what we do is we look at the total angle that occurs. So once again, you have this ray coming like so and going like this. We know that there's the two bends. There's a bend here and a bend there. But what we do <clears throat> if the triangle is reasonably regular is we just do one angle called the angle of deviation. And what this does is <clears throat> tells us how much the light actually bends. So when we do that, <clears throat> what we find is the following. If we have rays coming to these three different prisms, <clears throat> the angle at the top of the prism controls the angle of deviation. So in this case, it's fairly slight. It's more here, and it's very dramatic in the final one. And so <clears throat> we'll use this angle here, alpha, we won't get into the mathematics, but as alpha increases, the angle of deviation also increases. And this is going to be a very important concept in how we ultimately arrive at things like lenses and so forth. <clears throat> because if we go back to what I had to say about our pinhole camera, uh, we were not satisfied with how bright the image was or that we couldn't project it and so forth. And the image was not accessible. If we can take light from a larger area, take more of the rays that come from a particular part of the object and recondense them in a response in a, in a coherent way, our images will be brighter and all the rest. So this was, of course, the challenge. Now, how do you do that? What do we do here? So let's remember the fundamental idea I gave you at the beginning of this video, and that was, of course, that the wave, the light rays must go only to the part of the image that is representative of the object. <clears throat> and so, once again, we have our tree, and we have what well, we hope it will be an image. And then the question is, what do we do? Well, we can do a few things. Uh, we can try, we've got this angle of deviation. We do know from the pinhole camera that crossing the rays worked. Perhaps if we use a glass optic in some way that gets the rays to cross through a point like this, that maybe we will enter with an image. So let's try that. <clears throat> so in a pinhole camera, the rays all passed through a common point. Let us <clears throat> try to produce a similar optical path uh, using uh, prisms, uh, etc. 
We don't know what we're doing. Okay, let's be very clear. This is not a, a plan. We're messing around. But we have this successful example. We did create an image here. <clears throat> so why don't we try something like that? So here's what we can do. <clears throat> we could put uh, so a prism like this and another one like this. The rays will cross. Right. But it's not good enough because what happens is the rays are all parallel. So you get the crossing like this. <clears throat> and we do not get that point. So there has no <clears throat> no common point. Whatever else may be true, if that's the experiment we're trying to do, this shape will not do it. But what we begin to realize <clears throat> is if we do the following. Up here, let's suppose we use the black point here as a reference. Up here, if this green ray was bent a little more, it could go through there. If this green ray here was bent a little less, it could go through there. And the same would be true for here. So the thinking then is the following. We know from the previous uh, panel that if a ray, if the triangle is very thin or that both sides are, the angle here is very small, that the bend is very little. <clears throat> so what we want is we want an aggressive bend at the top. So we're going to make a fairly aggressive triangle. And then we'll have sides that are a little bit more reasonable then very almost parallel here and then a more of a trapezoid again and finally a point <clears throat> and you can see while it will not be precise you can see that this will then come like this this will bend here this will bend and I'm going to miss it deliberately because it's not quite good enough yet <clears throat> And similarly, we will have this one coming through there, sort of, and this one perhaps through somewhere like here. So this is an improvement, no question about it. We are on the right track. <clears throat> an improvement. But not finished. All right. Let's go then to the next panel and see what we can do. Well, what first off, what's, what we're going to do, and this should be clear, I hope, to you now, is we're going to simply make a continuous shape here where the curve will be continuously changing. Now, let's have a look at that in a bigger view. <clears throat> So I'll take my, um, make a bigger image here of this. We'll draw a line through the center like this. <clears throat> we'll get away from pine trees for a moment and just use an arrow. Now, <clears throat> let's make the arrow a little taller perhaps, just for simplicity. There we go. Now, we know because the triangle is fatter here at the top, we're going to get a more aggressive bend. Here the sides are almost parallel, we'll get hardly any bend. So what you get is the following. <clears throat> we can take a ray from the top, let's say, like so. And again, we'll just use our angle of deviation. We will not bother with the double refraction, which of course is uh, what, the, um, what truly happens, but just for the sake of arguments, and it is not... Uh, so we'll just say there's a point here, and so this will bend and go through the point. Let's take another ray <clears throat> from this point. Now I'm going to be probably hideously uh, wrong here, but we'll have to accept my improper artwork. <clears throat> there we go. What we can see here now is that these rays cross. At this point, <clears throat> two rays from the point of the arrow go through the optic and recombine right here and nowhere else. 
And so we can construct an upside down arrow here. This will be true <clears throat> for the other parts of the arrow and we'll produce uh, appropriate images there. So we find with this strategy of using the <clears throat> triangular pr pr uh, prisms that was based on the horizontal block, which was based on how things behave when they get into sticky situations, that we have found a way to create an image that is far more substantial than what we would get with a uh, pinhole camera. Now, I'm going to stop this video here. It gets too long, perhaps, and but we'll go into how the different ways these rays can produce images and so forth uh, and all the rest of it and look at the different types of images they form. So just to review briefly, we have had the idea of geometric optics, the uh, that we're dealing with macroscopic effects, uh, the idea of lenses and mirrors and things like this. With some general history I mentioned about the optics that, again, may well have been a great deal lost to history, <clears throat> that the Romans used gems to look through that could see better, gave accidental refraction. Ibn Saul may well have created optics in the around 960 CE that led to the use of spectacles and so forth in the 13, 12, and 13 and 1400s in paintings in southern Europe, which arguably would be uh, at some level trading with that part of the world, even with the uh, very deep divisions politically and religiously between those areas. We know by the 1600s that <clears throat> scientifically uh, things were becoming to the point where we could make optics specifically for what we wanted them to do. So then we back away and say, okay, well, let's understand this as best we can. <clears throat> and so we had the horizontal block. We found if it was perfectly straight and up to date, the light would go right through it. Another getting slightly dimmer, there wouldn't be any material effect. Uh, then we canted it <clears throat> and found there was a shift. And from that, we could extrapolate that maybe the light was slowing down. Maybe it really is, maybe it really isn't, but we could certainly take advantage of that appearance. And then from that, we developed the laws of refraction. From that we looked at how light traveled through different shapes of glass, primarily triangular ones, and recognizing what, on a shot in the dark that the pinhole camera had a point where all the rays go through, which is right here, this one here. Um, all the rays from different parts of this will come through here, and we call this point the focus. Now we're going to come back to uh, lots of this uh, in the next segment, but just to uh, illustrate it here. So I think it's an interesting journey uh, from the basics of how we figured things out to get to the point where we could make a biconvex lens and begin to make things work. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, hopefully you understand this. And again, I remind you, uh, all of you, that if, if you're not clear on any of these concepts, if there's something wrong, or if I've made a mistake, please email me and I will either correct it by email or if it's, if it's that hideous, I will make a, a subsequent video to fix it. Thank you very much for watching.